Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another episode of Voices for Excellence. I am your host, Dr. Michael Connor, CEO and founder of the Agile Evolutionary Group and proud host of VFE. And today's guest, I would say he is just not only a close colleague, a friend, but he is a brother to me. Uh, we grew up together. And I like to say we grew up together in education ranks. Um, literally, I have I have known Dr. Robert Zawicki for, I would say, over 10 years, right? And this was, uh, we uh, Robert and I, we met, I'll never forget, this was, yeah, roughly about 10, 11 years ago at the Model School Conference. Yeah, this was when we were we were young. We were talking about the superintendent role, wanting to be in the superintendent role, going through that trajectory and literally seeing Dr. Zawicki, right? This is my brother. Uh, I always say he's my brother from another mother. <laughs> but literally seeing uh, Dr. Zawicki take two superintendent roles uh, in New Jersey, both highly, highly successful uh, forward thinker, uh, former superintendent of Weehawk and former superintendent of Mount Olive, just been following his work, have done a number, a number of things. Uh, literally, literally during COVID, uh, led the the charge, led what best practices look like during COVID, the weekly communications. Uh, literally, I was at, calling him up and asking Robert, hey, you know, what are some of your ideas that you're doing uh, for COVID? No problem. Gave it to me shared those best practices, incorporating uh, those best practices when I was a superintendent during COVID as well, model his communication strategy. I mean, it was just lucid altogether. Uh, he is just, I would I say, one of the most progressive forward thinkers in education. Uh, he was future driven and future focused uh, years ago, years, years, years ago. And now um, Robert is just like I said, uh, one of the leaders in education. As you can see, I'm just ranting on and on and on about him because uh, he is one of my best friends in the field. So uh, you're now he has, brother, I love you. You know that. And he, has, too, he, has, <laughs> he has successfully transitioned into a new role at Renaissance where he is the Senior Director for Strategic Community Partnerships. And it is an absolute honor to have my brother, one of my best friends, colleagues, on VFE, Dr. Robert Zawicki out of New Jersey. Big brother, what's going on? Thank you so much. Listen, that introduction was amazing. And the, you know, the feeling is mutual. It's whenever I uh whenever I talk about you, I say this is the guy uh who I think is the the most progressive educational leader we have. And you you see things, you know, uh 300 miles out and you 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 want to talk about it and you want to do what's right for kids and you have the courage to, to lead there. And so you've been an inspiration to me along the way. And, you know, being a superintendent's a lonely, lonely job. And for us to be able to connect as we were coming up, as we were in the role um, and fighting through so many of the, you know, the unprecedented things, you know, the equity challenges that we tackled, um, the, the, the COVID whole thing, it, you know, you were a major intellectual and emotional support for me and inspiration. And, uh, I appreciate your words because, you know, and that's what friendship is, man. It's a give and take. And, you know, um, but yeah, and I'm so glad to to be on here and, uh, you know, to be in a place where we can both talk about all the best parts of education yep. and uh, how our commitment to kids, you know, uh, transcends our role. Um, and I, I think, you know, you have gone to a place where you have this international voice now and rightfully you should. And so, um, to be able to, to talk more education with you on this forum is just, uh, I'm so excited for it. So thank you for having me. Man, no, I, I appreciate that and appreciate those words because, you know, when I think about it, 11 years ago, right, Rob, and uh, we were just starting out, man, and to see where we're at now, 11 years later, and the platform, right, that we have to really broaden this equity work, broaden this future-driven innovation work uh, on a much deeper scale um, is intoxicating, uh, is invigorating. And to have you as a partner, we're going to be collaborating a lot. So I just look forward to that. But let's get into the episode because, you know, I'm thinking of 
This is going to be a conversation that we've always had over the course of 10 years, mm-hmm. and now we'll be able to get to share it with the world. So Absolutely. I'm interested in this because I've never asked you this, right? And now I get to see the true Dr. Robert Zawicki, right? But when education stakeholders engage with you in New Jersey or nationally, what is your excellence and equity song that describes your leadership signature? What song will leaders and practitioners identify as your equity and excellence song in the ecosystem, Dr. Zawicki? Wow. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> That's uh, that, I think that that that's intense. I even think of a literal psalm. Um, so you want to know what? If I had to pick a literal, oops, uh, if I had to pick a two literal songs, right? This is going to show the dichotomy of me, uh, where I was born, where I where I live. Um, uh, I think it would be uh, Wu Tang Forever and Woo! Thunder Road by Bruce Springsteen. And- wait, 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 hold on, hold on, that right there is a paradox in itself, Dr. Zawick. Yes, that's wait, 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 repeat that one more time for my listeners. Tang Forever and and Thunder Road by Bruce Springsteen. Elaborate, please. So, okay, so let me let me do the Wu Tang thing, right? So, um, you know, I was born in Staten Island, born born in Shaolin, um, grew up in Bayonne in Jersey City. So there, there's part of me that is this, uh, and I feel I'm, I'm most successful in a in an urban setting. Because it's a place where um, when I talk about uh, inequities and, you know, it's funny, you and I were both using the term equity long before it became in vogue. You know, it's in both of our dissertations. Um, It's not it was something that, you know, before it was every hashtag. Right. And um, and uh, so that that equity work uh, was so visceral growing up where I grew up and how I entered education and, and the kids I worked with and and what what drove me to the, the passion to do it. You know, um, the, the the idea that there is, I, I truly believe that education is the biggest investment in national security. I think education is the biggest investment um, as as a as a you know to cure uh, all of our social ills, but more importantly to to provide for civic dialogue. You know, we need an informed citizenry and all the things that you see where. You know, we're in all these divided camps nationally, and this this is breakdown. That goes back to you know, do our kids really understand how how to collaborate, how to how to look at information, how to do that? And I think that's been lost on some people. Um, so the the Wu Tang thing is uh, the reason why I say that, and particularly that song. It's it's a brazen song mm-hmm. about uh, kind of traveling through uh, you know uh, an environment where you have to be you have to be strong. You have to have a voice and you have to have passion and conviction and that you're going to outlast your critics and the obstacles in the way because you believe kind of in yourself. So there's a little bit of that, you know, Shaolin swagger in, in, in my work. Um, I think it's also what can we completely honest. I think it's also helped me, you know, connect with, you know, the kids I've served, you know? Um, and so, uh, I, that that's one part of me. The other part of me is I am a, a Jersey guy through and through. And um, you know, the poet who who speaks to the soul in New Jersey is is Bruce Springsteen. And you know, Thunder Road is is a song um that's, you know, it's so sentimental, so longing, but yet so powerful. Um, and you know, it, it can really hit at your heartstrings. So I think both of those songs tie into that you have to have pride in where you come from. And the work that we're doing is about hearts and minds, right? And so the way that those songs can both grip you and, you know, really hit you, hit you in the center of your chest, right? But at the same time, when you listen to the lyrics of both those songs, you're like, wow. So I, I would say my, my, I try to do both of those with my leadership. Um, one, be very research-based, have that foot in the academic world. I'm very data-driven. Um, which, you know, can be off-putting to some people sometimes because you have to ask people to change their practices. But at the same time, also trying to, uh, you know, really lead with my heart. And, uh, you know, my superintendent that hired me when I was at High Point, where, and I served Scott Ripley as an assistant superintendent, he really gave me the license to say, where is she, and not be weird about this, but we do what we do because we love kids. Right. And and you have to be bold enough to be able to stand up in front of people and say, I love kids, even when they're imperfect, 
even when they're not getting a scholarship, even when they're they're misbehaving and they're raging on me for what's going on in their lives, right? That's the that's the ultimate test. And if we're going to love kids, we need to love the people who serve kids. So I think um, the message from both of those songs is this bold, with like throw whatever you can throw at me. Yeah, um, I'm gonna keep going on forever and Thunder Road. And no, uh, Doctors of Wicked, that, that is a great, 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 great response. I'm telling you, I talk about a paradox, right? <laughs> uh, Wu Tang Clan. I, I, I mean that that goes back to you know when we were in middle school. Rob. You got it, man. No, no, yeah. But Wu came out when I was like in seventh, eighth grade. But yes, Wu Tang Forever and yep. uh, New Jersey's finest, Bruce Springsteen. Yep. But when you look at the <clears throat> interconnectivity right between both of those songs the micro and macro themes that i hear from that is to uh keep pushing on staying strong uh you alluded to um education being an investment with national security which i completely completely agree with right an educated uh ecosystem uh will have more of a chance to make uh you know a sophisticated uh, decisions and be informed with their decisions. And then also education does address the societal uh, quandaries and equities that we uh, encounter or immerse as educators right now within this sector. But what I really like of how you connected both of those songs to your ground of practice of being research driven, being data driven. Yes, you are. And I know that you know, uncomfortable conversations around data and leading with the heart, right? We, that's a that's a missing element, especially now that we need to incorporate in the AC stage of education. But more importantly, you know, when you say that, you know, you like the kids, you got to focus on the kids. I remember a statement that I always uh, that I always used to say that used to really, really um, get under people's skin that I love the kids a little bit more than adults. So, you know, but that's true when you have to be bold to change, you know, practices collectively, especially I think the hardest thing to change in education, which is um, a shared mental model, right? Collective yeah. mindsets around one goal. But moving on, right? And this is objectively stated, subjectively stated. It's kind of like that Wu Tang Clan Bruce Spring, uh, Bruce Springsteen hybrid, right? And this statement, again, like I said, is I believe this because I think that we were drawn to each other for so long because of our progressive practices. Yeah and how you grounded innovation and equity before it became an educational fad. I like to say in the BC stage of education, I used to highlight your work, follow your work and underscore elements of your work into my practices because uh, you are considered and I am considering you one of the most progressive education leaders and yes, superintendent in the country. So when we talk about each other's progressive practices, that was just us just meeting there and just, you know, refining uh, different variants within our practices, but specifically your work that you did in the BC stage of education around instructional systems, redesign, re-engineering of instructional systems to be future driven, right? Yep. So as we move into the second year of the AC stage of education after COVID-19, which will be the 2023-2024 academic year, what would it take leaders to be future ready for this new education demand of Delta 2030? So uh, it, it's really grounded in things that, in you know, kind of pedagogies and ideas that you and I connected on 11 years ago. So those truths remain. Uh, I think the approach needs to be a little bit different, but I'm, I'm going to hit you with, I think, what are the, the three biggest things? I think no, number one, we need to have an absolute obsession over high school graduation rate. And everything that we do, whether it's algebra one completion, whether it's first grade and third grade reading, level, um, social emotional learning, all of it, all of it is about um, high school graduation rate. And it's not, you know, some people will say, oh, that's because, you know, you're a superintendent and you want, you know, you want that data so you can put it No, it's about saving lives. Kids who graduate from high school can enter the military directly. They, they qualify for jobs. They can go back to community college or enter an apprentice training program at any time. It is literally diff the difference between living above and below the poverty line. So if you don't believe in schools, you, you, you know, you just believe 
in in looking for outcomes for the return on the taxpayer's investment. You know, as Harry Wong said 30 years ago, we're in the diploma business, right? That is the number one indicator of us bringing in these kids. And, you know, a 90% grad rate, which a lot of people will fly a flag for, um, that's still a 10% mulligan we're taking here. You know, you never go to a hospital that says, oh, we got a 10% more mortality right you would never do that right sure. um so we we've accepted a margin of error there that i think is is way too high um because of some you know things that go on with reporting i think you know every district should really shoot for 95 96 so i think a real emphasis on that is the number one outcome and an obsession over that is what we need because what we're starting to see is slippage in grad rates mm-hmm. particularly amongst uh female populations which are shocking um, but we're starting to see a slippage and we, we hit a peak kind of, uh, you know, middle of the Obama administration. And then, you know, it, it has, has gone down because of COVID. Um, I, I really think we need to do that. And the, the pathway to that, you know, we used to call it RTI, but it's really multi-tiered systems of support. And, you know, that's kind of how you want to call it. But the, the future ready piece of that um, is one, understanding that MTSS now is an integrated MTSS model. So multi-tiered systems of support, which includes four things. One is that academic RTI, which is the the first kind of component of it. So that includes, you know, your ESL, special education, your tier two interventions, and most importantly, your tier one equitable differentiation, where the core yeah. classroom, every kid gets differentiated instruction and, and, and you know, our intervention programs are not a place to a dumping ground for kids who are pain, right? Um, the second piece is that behavioral RTI. I mean, so many districts um, coming out of COVID, I think are still ill-equipped to to track discipline data on frequency, but also intera- negative interactions with teachers, stressful interactions with teachers, trips to the guidance scouts. So there's just frequency data that can inform and and make us more proactive in how we reach out to kids. Right. And then using screening tools to really assess, you know, where kids are at risk and they're, you know, kind of from a mental health perspective too. The third piece, which is so lost, is that the the data that we get from universal screening and academic RT high and in our SEL also tells us which kids need to be enriched. And so um, we really need to think about which kids in underrepresented populations are just not getting identified because it's re- we're relying on old school teacher recommendation rather than universal screening to pump kids into accelerated programs. Um, and you know, on a side note for that, I think computer science is the biggest thing we need to accelerate every kid in, and uh, we need to start tying that into early screening. And then the fourth area, depending on what state you're in, um, could be called different things. The fourth area can be SEL. Some people call it cultural competency. Some people call it collaboration and kind of future ready uh, habits for learning. Mm-hmm. And so approaching um, your curriculum program, your behavioral program under this umbrella is how we need to move forward systematically. It's a playbook to get out of the pandemic um, to, to you know, un, you know, unrealized learning gains, uh, you know, learning loss is a way to attack that, but it also creates a system for whatever comes at us next, right? Because there's going to be other issues in the future um, that we have a system in place to proactively meet the needs of the whole student. Um, and, you know, there's a sneaky, I don't want to say sneaky, it's a hidden thing mm-hmm. that you can, you can, you know, if someone's looking for a framework that they can sneak in, but the Harvard Edry Design Group put out uh, something called student success plans, which are the, basically these four domains that match up to MTSS to create a metacognitive uh, experience for kids and to, to attend to those four areas. So lining up data systems that provide screening and, a, and something to host all of this where parents can get the information, teachers can get the information, and then it's not just a, a data warehouse that central office looks at. That is the real challenge to bringing all this to life. Nice. Um, and that's, you know, I think where you're bringing this old school pedagogy of MTSS, yeah. this constant emphasis on grad rate, um, but a need to really harness data systems. And so that's that's why I'm at Renaissance, um, quite frankly, is is merging those things together into an ecosystem that can really, really support kids. I, I tell you, Dr. Zawicki, and this is um, kind of, I like to say deja vu, uh, what we always talk about with uh, whether it be instruction, uh, mm-hmm. looking at different methodologies and pedagogies uh, with the depth and breadth. But 
Uh, when you talk about the obsession of the graduation rates, it is absolutely correct because, you know, um, the one of our, our previous episodes, we had Dr. Bill Daggett on, and he gave a startling, startling metric, national metric that um, we're not even graduating 50% of our students in college. I believe it's a little bit under 50% um, where that is not acceptable, right? So when we think about how the system is designed, structures and systems is to prepare students for college readiness, but we can we completely, completely ignore, I like to say career readiness as we mm -hmm. talk about, but yep. now the next stage is digital readiness, right? Absolutely. Because readiness, we're going to have to start looking at um, AI being incorporated, where now AI is being disrupted, where it's going to be AGI. AGI is something that uh, is coming to us sooner than a lot of mm -hmm. people expect. Everybody's like, oh, what is AGI? We'll unwrap that in another episode, but not for this. But what I really love about this, right, is uh, your 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 alignment of the graduation rates uh, and ensuring that there's an instructional system that supports students, the multi-tier system of support model. But more importantly, I like the level of, I like to say, exploitation where it is enhanced and integrated. Obviously, when we talk about academic RTI, I, I think that, and I want you just to really focus on, um, if you can, just as a subvariant question, tier one differentiation, right? You see a national issue, Dr. Zawicki, with regards to alignment of tier one, first of all. Uh, we know one of the biggest continuous improvement levers uh, within that process is improving the quote unquote quality. We have to define and measure what quality is the quality in quote unquote measure effectiveness of tier one instruction, right? And when we add that element of differentiation, now we teachers are really going to have to transition into what I call practitioners, right? That's my like practitioners because a variety of different methods, pedagogies, and tactics need to be applied. Uh, to each of their students, personal, uh, personalized instruction one-on-one, but tier one differentiation, there is a real loose definition of what that looks like. For level setting purposes with our viewers and audience of VIA, I got it for you. Define what tier one sure. differentiation is. So my, uh, my favorite definition comes from Caroline Tomlinson. But before I give it to you, um, what's so funny is if you look at the job description for most teachers in most states and most districts, bullet point one is differentiate instruction for all learners. There's some type of statement like that. Right. And when you ask teachers to define differentiation, these are people who have master's degrees and 60 plus credits on the salary guide. Right. They will struggle to define differentiation. And so... That's an indictment of our, and I'm, I'm not bad mouthing teachers. It's an indictment of our um, our our education programs, and it's an indictment of our professional learning that this isn't at the core, and we haven't supported our teachers. So the first way we haven't supported our teachers is giving them data so they can answer this question: Yeah, what is the composition of my classroom? Yeah. So the number one thing that erodes differentiation is that a fourth grade teacher comes into the school year thinking rightly or wrongly, that every kid in my fourth grade is on grade level, right? Now, now they'll tell you, yeah, we know that's not true, right? But they didn't have a mechanism to, yeah. to substantiate that, to say, in my class of 30 kids, 10 of them are need support, five are approach standing, you know, five are, are meet standards, and, you know, 10 are exceed standard, right? They don't have that data. So they can't get, even get into what is good differentiation until they can answer that question on the first day of school. Right. So getting once you get into that, and I feel we've beaten up teachers, differentiate, differentiate, differentiate without giving them the tools. Right. And then the second thing is actually defining it for them. And so Carolyn Tomlinson defines it uh, as follows. So differentiation is differentiation for content. Um, that's one of the easiest ones to do. And in 90% of the cases, you're differentiating based upon uh, independent reading level, or you're taking your text, whether it's math, whether it's ELA, you know, and ELA is everything other than math. Um, you're you're differentiating based upon that that lexile level. The second thing um, is differentiating for for process, and this gets into 
you know, universal design for learning. You know, it's it's all of your accommodations, your modifications. And listen, if you're gonna give it to one kid, you might as well give it to all of them. You know, how do you say to one kid, you can use a graphic organizer because you have a 504, but you're two seats away and you have a C and you're struggling. So you get that IEP or 504, you can't use the graphic organizer, right? So it, you know, it's it's opening up all those supports to to every kid. The third piece, which I think is so hard for so many teachers, is differentiation from product. This idea that every kid is going to, it's going to be the recipe. You know, every kid is going to give you the exact, and I was guilty of that. I remember when I taught social studies, we would, every kid would make a wanted poster for Martin Luther, um, you know, kind of like an old West, right? And it was, you know, the diet of verbs. I was teaching European history, you know, world history, uh, but every kid made the same thing, right? And I, I didn't let them choose their own product, right? But that's when kids shine when you can let them choose their own product. And when you let kids choose their own product, use digital tool or make it old school, hands-on, you're, you're hitting all their multiple intelligences. And you're also probably checking all the boxes for IEP and 504 compliance too, right? Because you're, you're, they're building in those modifications. And then the, the last one is in Caroline and Tolleson uses the term learning environment. And so the one with modification I would make to that is to call it grouping. So when she means learning environment, it's how you structure the class. So making the decision on how you group kids, um, you're asking the question, do I group the kids heterogeneously or homogeneously? So if it's math, the research shows group the kids homogeneously, right? The, the exceed standards kid, when you put them with a need support kid, all of a sudden this kid is struggling with number three. This kid wants to go to 27. Putting them together, they don't benefit. There's no zone of proximal development there. In the ELA subjects, when you're not doing interventions, but regular instruction, heterogeneous is where there's zone of proximal development. This is where, you know, I hear you read the word brown, I read the word green, and you reading brown helps me, you know, phonetically decode green, right? So there's zone of proximal development there. So the baseline in the ELA subjects, which is everything other than math, should start heterogeneous. Now, when you're doing interventions, you always trend to more homogeneous grouping. But right there, giving teachers data. What's the composition of your classroom? When you're grouping kids, are you grouping in a way that you're making your life harder? Um, so grouping, heterogeneous or homogeneously, differentiation for product, differentiation for, for process and content. Those are the four things. And if you step back from that practitioner piece to kind of the macro researcher piece, yeah. when you don't have that, you have tier two problems. You have a glut of kids. You then have behavioral problems. You have equity problems where kids aren't being identified for, you know, special ed partially, you know, they're not going through the referral process or they're stuck in, you know, basic skills for three or four years and kind of this due process, you know, purgatory. And then you're not getting kids identified for, for gifted and talented. So yeah. giving teachers that data, giving them the definition and supporting them in this learning process is how you make tier one a reality. Yeah. Uh, to my audience and uh, listeners, and I like to, uh, Dr. Zawicki, uh, uh, reference <clears throat> uh, Hattie's work. Right. Yeah. And the effect size of uh, direct instruction. Right. And mm -hmm. use this as a professional learning tool, a platform for asynchronous learning for my audience. I'll tell you, Rob, that answer was perfectly defined with the definitions uh, or the definition of uh, differentiation content, process, product. And I love how you. Uh, created this alignment of grouping with learning environments from uh, Dr. Tollison's work. But overall, um, overarching kind of this implicit and latent theme that, um, you know, leaders should investigate is in order to truly differentiate content process product grouping in uh, your words, there needs to be a level of interoperability with data systems, providing clean, uh, viable data sets and ensuring that our practitioners and teachers, including leaders at that executive level, who I still consider that they have to be instructional leaders mm -hmm. you know, to be able to manage the board, uh, obviously the operational components of a system, but the superintendent CEO should always be the lead instructional leader, yep. be able to talk about instruction and going back into classrooms, but understanding to build systems, data systems, where there's that level of API or interoperability, however, mm -hmm. uh, words you want to do, uh, you want to utilize. But yes, cultural competence, the behavioral data, 
Um, when you talk about this level of frequency of data, uh, the statistician comes out of me, Dr. Zawicki, right? Mm -hmm. When we look at time series properties, right? Those mm -hmm. analyses, seasonality, seasonality is equivalency to uh, frequency. But we could talk all day about this a little bit. I want to, let me get to the next question, right? So sure. you alluded to it before. Yes, congratulations on your new role at Renaissance <laughs> Education. Listen, you sound important. Senior Director of Strategic Community Partnerships. Wait a Let me say that again one more time, Rob. Senior Director of Strategic Community Partnerships. I cannot be more happy for you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Just Thank so, you. so happy uh, for you. But I know what that position is. I know exactly what you're doing. You're changing the world. You're doing that good work. Uh, you know, you were just recently at ISTE, you know, really sharing your knowledge, your thought. Uh, leadership, your leadership signature when it comes to instruction, MTSS uh, for Renaissance. But for my VFE participants who are not familiar with Renaissance education and only know you through the lens of a superintendent, right? What is your new role and how are you implementing your knowledge, innovation, and equity-driven practices at the national level? Sure. Well, thanks. So so it's... I, I Renaissance has meant a lot to me as a as a parent and a practitioner. So um, all of my kids, uh, you know, Renaissance is probably best known for the STAR assessments, but there's a whole ecosystem of tools. We now have STAR phonics, so there's, so there's STAR math, uh, there's STAR reading, there's Accelerated Reader, which was one of the first kind of personalized learning tools, but there's tools like Freckle and La Lilo, um, and we now have Flocabulary. Last night I was at the Flocabulary uh, poetry slam, you know, which gets kids to, to learn vocabulary through rapping and, and singing right. and lyrics, poetry, man, it, you know, just such, such inspirational stuff. So Renaissance has so many products now. Um, and they recently acquired, uh, Illuminate. And so the edge climber platform kind of is that, that piece that pulls together data from everywhere, whether it's Renaissance or not Renaissance to create that MTSS system. Yeah. But for me as a parent, um, whether it was for my my oldest daughter, my my youngest daughter, my son, uh, my oldest boy, or my youngest boy, Renaissance has been really important for my wife and I in seeing where um, our kids are at. It has prescriptively um, really you know changed their 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 entire trajectory. So you know it was Star Renaissance that you know uh, first identified my son was having having issues that led to his his diagnosis of being visually impaired um it was star that really helped get some support for for my youngest daughter and now she's you know succeeding all over the place so you know as a parent having access to that data similar to where we brought our babies into the world with the apgar score and all the data where we'd go to the pediatrician and they'd be like you know, your kid has a head size in the 95th percentile and they're, high, you know, you're like all that, that kind of data you get, it provides that academic data. So Renaissance has meant a lot to me as a parent and as a superintendent, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a crucial tool for me in implementing MTSS and achieving high graduation rates and, and keeping kids on track um, um, during the, the pandemic. So, you know, it, it's a company that, you know, our new tagline is see every student and it's a really vision mission organization and the the people are all educators and truly committed to that and so my value system that we've talked about is completely aligned here so i, I feel really good about that but so my job it's funny because even people in the organization are like what what do you really do <laughs> so um so uh the the model that they came up um, it, it's basically in three buckets. So, so first and foremost, um, I'm helping to advance the conversation around multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and you know, where that's taking shape in, in the district, you know, Tennessee has RTI squared. And so their, their system is very different than the IMTSS model in Florida, New York and Florida, both use IMTSS, but they're two different models because, you know, New York includes SEL in their model, whereas Florida doesn't, um, Connecticut is moving towards towards IMTSS, right? So having those conversations with leaders, building capacity around that, helping them take the tools they have and kind of strategically plan around that is one of my roles from a right outward facing piece. From an inward facing piece, um, I'm helping to have these conversations with every member of the organization so they can understand what the boots on the ground reality is for superintendents, assistant superintendents, principals, teachers, tech leaders, 
you know, around their current demands, how it is changing state by state and and in internationally. And then the other piece, the reason why the term strategic is then there are our strategic districts are, you know, the the largest districts in the country. And so working with, you know, we work a lot with the, you know, the Council of Great City Schools. Um, I know we'll both be at the conference in uh, in October. Um, but working with with those districts and what's what's and so inspiring about those districts is, you know, they have so many people who are committed, but they're so big. They have so many different departments. And so one of the things that I'm I'm really enjoying is is making connections for them, you know, because they have big, big, you know, different departments under the the MTSS umbrella and seeing how they can work together more efficiently to to do things for kids. So, you know, I get to talk about my favorite parts of education. Um, every single day, I get to interact with educators or people who are committed to to the equity, you know, equitable advancement of all kids. And then the other thing I'm going to be doing is creating some events um, for for people like us, you know, the next generation or people who came up like us in a similar situation. You know, one of the things that we benefited from the model schools thing was this freedom to have those raw conversations. You know, my my district has a 79 percent grant rate. Here's what I'm working on. I'm a work in progress. You know. Um, to have those spaces learn from each other the way that, you know, I got so much, you know, from interacting with you to create those spaces um, and then do some research and, and some case studies and 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 promote that and, and let that shine. So um, I absolutely love this position. And uh, the thing that I love is that, you know, the leadership, the senior leadership of our organization, which I'm, I'm a part of, but our executive leadership really gets that we have a bunch of tools, but we need to be pedagogy first which is, I think, a completely different thing from what a lot of other ed tech companies are saying. We're leading with pedagogy. We want to support you with these pedagogies. We have amazing tools. We think they're the best tools to get this done. But unless you get the pedagogy, you can buy a million tools and it won't work. And that's why you see districts cycle every three years, different RFPs, trying different tools, but the pedagogy doesn't exist. They don't have an MTSS system. They don't have a good universal training. They haven't trained their teachers and invested in their teachers on differentiation. So whatever tool you buy is going to fail unless you lead with pedagogy. And so I get to be part of that conversation and have the freedom to do that in this company. Uh, I tell you, you know what? Congratulations again. Uh, You know how proud I am of you with this when you told me about this transition. Um, I said that is right up you know, Rob's alley. And when you think about it, right, I when I hear you uh, speaking of your position, it is your passion now, right? You get to talk about, because um, I've always respected you, uh, Dr. Zwicky, with regards to your uh, core knowledge around instruction, right? And one thing I, I you know, I, I, I really tried to do, especially when I was a superintendent, was to identify and target uh, superintendents that I consider to be one of the best in the country uh, with regards to instruction, right? Redesigning and reauthoring uh, the system to be grounded on pedagogy first, pedagogy and data. I, I know that, you know, we, and I'm glad that you're really pushing towards moving away from, I like to say, archaic psychometrics and moving towards that progressive pedagogy. The integrated multi tier system of support, there's nobody better in the country than you to be able thank to you, thank you. and look in that level of connectivity between large districts and research and case studies uh leading with pedagogy first um that is just like i said uh intoxicating and invigorating because i've always believed you know we can you know innovation which is a a, a misnomer about the definition um, that is used in education. That's why I always want to create that aligned mental model around that definition of innovation. You can have or adopt all of the AI tools or advanced tools or emerging technologies in your district, but the core foundational lever of change management, I will always say instruction, core instruction, pedagogy. Absolutely. I, I'm so happy for you. I can't wait Thank to you. you. Uh, see the work that you're doing and then also collaborate with you as well. But there's, there's a little uniqueness to you. And I want to be able to bring this question to you because I, I think you're one of the only uh, superintendents, former superintendents that I knew or that I know of that actually served on a board of education <laughs> while they were a superintendent. I mean, to me, Hey, we can say this on BFE. That is gangster. 
<laughs> but now, but going back into that role when you were a board of education member and served as superintendent at the same time, very, 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 very rare in education. But from this lens of plurality, right? How do we bridge the gap from your foundational experiences, right? How do we bridge the gap between board of education as superintendent relations, right? What advice, knowing that you played on that dual role, right? What advice can you provide after those experiences when you served as a board member and superintendent? So, so that was, it was a, uh, it was, and it was during COVID too, right? So, <laughs> uh, so my phone was just constantly blowing up. Um, and then, you know, it, you're also a political lightning rod twice over when you do that. Um, and, you know, a lot of friends of mine who, um, you know, I would say a lot, the handful of friends of mine uh, that did both, you know, were like, what are you doing? Right. Um, but I think, you know, we, listen, I, I think we accomplished a, a lot of things uh, when I was on the board and I, w- I was proud to do it. Um, the, uh, I got to see, so this is the, the big part with board superintendent relations. I got to firsthand see and experience this early as a superintendent and a board member, the shift from board meetings where no one would come very rarely, you know, um, to these YouTube broadcast board meetings where people are watching them on the big screen. Friends are coming to their houses. People have drinking games based upon, you know, if someone, if someone says this word, you know, mask mandate, you have to Pound your beer, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're live tweeting it, and it, it's on, it's on Facebook, and you know, and the other thing too that it, it kind of contributed to the to the lack of civility around education. So people couldn't go fight Trump, they couldn't fight Fauci, they can't go fight Joe Biden. But I can come to the board meeting, and I can tell the board my 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 mind, you know, and then I can take that clip and I can put it on Facebook. Right, you know, on my my whatever group I have. So um that's where things I think spun out of control for both superintendents and for for boards. The other thing that happened is superintendents became the the spokesperson for policies that were being set at the governor's level. So the governor would decide through executive order in every state, and then you know, the local superintendent would have to deliver these messages. So the people who didn't even know who the superintendent was, now all of a sudden you're, you know, you're kind of bigger face than your mayor or your local senator. Um, so some boards embraced that and wanted the superintendents uh, to be the spokesperson. Other boards, you know, did not. So I think fundamentally what got eroded more than ever, but the best board relationships are predicated on the on the idea that the board is there for governance. Yeah, They've hired, you know, a CEO to run the organization yeah. And they're there for governance. You're there to evaluate the executive. And I think that gets lost. And so it was unpopular at times, I have to say, as a board member, where I would, you know, be like, hey, there needs to be a check here. We need to let we need to let the, you know, the executive lead on this um and understand what they're going through. So I think what started to happen is a, a lack of empathy for between from board members to superintendents, the physical and mental stress of of leading through the pandemic and we've never really kind of uh, uh, dealt with that. But trust is everything. And so to have that really good relationship, superintendents have to be able to trust the board that when people go to them with complaints, they go to them with issues, they're not going to try and administer the district and they're going to push things to the superintendent. That is the fundamental issue. When that breaks down, the trust um, erodes and then Everything, you know, it's like, it's what when they say when you, you know, a baseball hits a, a windshield, you get that spider web, right? That's when it, it starts to shatter. And then all these other issues take over. Um, so it, it's a, the same way in a marriage, you have to constantly uh, attend to, to trust, to a relationship with a, with a parent. You, you know, trust is everything in your most crucial relationships. And it's something you need to attend to and you need to speak honestly about it. So if your board is not committed to that, if you're bored and as a board member, you're not committed to trusting the executive to lead, then then that's broken and there there needs to be a separation because the kids will the kids will suffer. I don't think many boards right now have the emotional capacity and many superintendents are so tapped out emotionally to do deep work on trust. 
trust is the foundation for garnet, right? And, you know, they're, they're getting the crap kicked out of them over budgets and all this other stuff. Um, I do think, and I can say this, I'll speak to my former board members, because the pandemic was so politicized, so many good things that were accomplished during the pandemic got lost in the sauce. Yeah. So boards and superintendents really did accomplish amazing things between 2020 and 2022. And we have not gotten credit for it. The board members who sacrificed out unpaid, unpaid, you know, hours every day from their working lives, their families never got the appreciation or credit for they went, what, what they went through. So maybe that's a starting point for some boards to come together with their superintendents and say like, hey, let's all acknowledge the good we did. And let's move forward together. But, um, you know, you see District Administrator Magazine has a uh, uh, a column that they update three times a week with all the superintendent turnover. Um, you know, boards really collectively need to say, how, why is this happening? What can we do differently? And, uh, you know, uh, it is a crisis in the superintendency because, but unless you have trust, it can't happen. And um, that trust begins with empathy. And I don't know if people have the... Uh, the bandwidth right now because everyone's spent to do that do that trust work um amongst all the the mechanisms and levers that need to be pulled and pushed during this time period absolutely no thank you for that answer because i love uh the statement that you made trust is the foundation of governance right and uh the turnover rate the churn that we are experiencing at the superintendent level um wow you know i yeah. heard um um outlandish metrics where you know there were there was a state that had 27 openings and to have 27 openings and within one state and it's a small state too um that means that there is new leadership coming mm -hmm. in and when there's new leadership coming in um obviously that is a disruptive cycle we do want new leadership but yeah. you know to have numbers of 27 that's open in one state uh that's huge Right. And that's where we're seeing this disjunction of two words uh, that why governance it hasn't been uh, successful over the last few years is around trust and empathy. And I think that you clearly distinctively uh, targeted what boards of education uh, should do. They only they only evaluate one person. <laughs> yeah, I think we got. That, we got to clear that misnomer, and and you you stated it at the outset. They only evaluate one person, and that mm -hmm. is the chief executive officer. You got it to evaluate and to adopt a budget, right? Yep. Those are the critical functions of a board of education. And I think that you know when you stated as a board member during COVID is that we have to be able to trust yep. the chief executive officer, i.e., the superintendent, to do his or her role. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that kind of gets lost where you get that push and pull. Oh, totally. And I think everywhere, when I talk to soups all over the country, because COVID was so politicized everywhere and out of panic, board members started to break down the chain of command Yeah, and have a lot of direct contact with principals and teachers, you know, questioning, are you, are you really in support of superintendent doing the mask mandate and none of them were like oh well he has to or she has to because of the governor right um but you would never see i always use this military analogy we would never tolerate the president of the united states going to a colonel an individual colonel and commanding a colonel to do something because that not what happened the president talks to the head of the, the joint chiefs of staff and the generals and admirals it runs through their system right that breakdown really everywhere spread like wildfire where there was this constant, you know, we're not honoring what the chief school administrators don't. We're going directly to to subordinates, which cause all kinds of issues. Cause now you these poor principals, they're struggling with all kinds of issues. Now they got a board member in their office because they the board member wants to get what do they really think about COVID protocols? You know, a superintendent from Pennsylvania was telling that a, that a board member did a tour of all the principals. What do you really think about this? You know, and the and the, the principals don't know what to say. What they should have said is like, go talk to the superintendent, one. Number two, what were, you know, our A, B day schedule was because of what the governor mandated, right? And, and, and so it really, we need to realign exactly what you just said 
um, that, you know, you hired someone with a lot of training, a lot of degrees, mm -hmm. certificates, you got to trust them. Even if, and, you, and no one's ever going to agree hundred percent. I always talk about 80, 20. And I used to say this to my board. Um, and I said, this as a board member, you know, think about what you need to bat to be in the hall of fame in baseball. Right. Sure. But if I'm good 80% of the time, that's great. I'm going to make mistakes 20% of the time. I'm a human being. Um, I'm imperfect. Um, but we got to give each other space. Everyone's going to be, let's give each other all that 20%. Well, I'll give you this one leadership lesson, and I know you'll you'll appreciate this. Syracuse University, they were the beast of the Big East, right? Do you remember when Syracuse University fired Paul Pascaloni, their head football coach, because he didn't win the Orange Bowl? Right? He got them to the Orange Bowl, and they lost, and they fired this legendary coach. Paul Pascaloni's from Connecticut, this FYI. Right? right? Now, like I know, so I felt this because that's how Rutgers got Ray Rice and Brian Leonard and, you know, Greg Schiano took off from there. But, okay. but think about that as a leadership decision. We have a great leader who had, you know, an 80% season or maybe exceeding that. And because we were chasing that extra piece that's almost like in, you know, we, we couldn't get the national championship, whatever. I mean, we, we tore the whole thing apart and. They've struggled ever since. And I see districts make these short, you know, short-sighted decisions all the time. We're going to, you know, pressuring, we're going to get rid of a principal or we're going to get rid of a coach or we're going to get rid of a superintendent because of, they didn't do this now. And they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. They're not looking at the whole scope of everything they have accomplished. But I, one thing I will say, superintendents need to do a better job recalibrating now because we were these individual spotlight you know, kind of leaders coming out of the pandemic, it needs to, we need to recalibrate to we, you know, it's the board and the superintendent together. The superintendent sits on the board as a non-voting member. I, I do think as a profession, we can, we can recalibrate and give a little deference and bring, you know, leverage some emotional intelligence to bring board members along with us as partners. Um, and, and not just people we report to. So there, there's less of that, um, that yeah. tension between the board and superintendent. Yeah, no, Dr. Zawicki, uh, recalibration, right? And I think yep. that encompasses the whole thing of, of your definition um, with governance, your explanations, your examples. Um, really, really good because I think that that breakdown of um, what you highlighted with regards to board, or as to say governance, superintendent relations, um, the focus on the now, right, as opposed to the totality and the holistic uh, system strategy. Um, it's just, like I said, we have to get back to what that recalibration and what yep. that looks like between wards and superintendents. So last question, Dr. Zawicki, right? And I want to look at three words, brother. And and I know that's tough for you. I'm, I'm going to say that this is tough for you. It's going to be an arduous task for you to limit yourself, Dr. Robert R. Zawicki, to three words. But, Doc, what three words do you want our audience to leave today's podcast regarding innovation and future-driven practices in the AC stage of education? What three words are important for all of our participants on BFV to know about improving the quality of education, the quality of that integrated multi-tier system of support for families and students. So the first word is empathy. Mm -hmm. um, we we need it for the student to meet them. That's the the foundation of the design process. So empathy for the teacher, for the student, for 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 where they're at. Um, the second thing is focus. We we do not have a common goal across every state. That grad rate is our number one focus. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think that that last piece is, is trust. Um, we need to, uh, create systems and cultures in schools, um, where we trust each other as a team to do what's right for kids and kind of stop with the adult drama and, uh, and really trust in our moral imperative for being there. Look at that. You wait, 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 you limited to three words. And, and to, wow, I'm proud of you, my brother. Thank Three you. words, empathy, focus, and trust. And when I think of that uh, triangulation, right, of empathy, focus, and trust, 
you know, that goes back to this underpinning notion of culture uh, in districts, culture within our schools, uh, culture amongst people. So Dr. Robert Art is a wicked, you know, I'm going to throw that in there, my brother. <laughs> if I wanted to get, or my audience want to get in contact with you, how would they be able to do that today? Easiest way is uh, Twitter, at Zwicky R, or um, on Instagram, Robert R. Zwicky, and you can find me on uh, on LinkedIn as well. I did launch a Substack. Uh, I hadn't been as good with blogging, but I will be switching over and blogging uh, on a Renaissance platform uh, really soon, uh, really focusing on MTSS. So take a, you know, uh, keep, your, keep your eye out for that, and when it comes out, take a look at that. One of the integrated multi-tier system of support uh, experts around the country, one of the um, highly regarded leaders with regards to uh, instruction. You want to talk about data and geek out with him. Uh, data systems, please reach out and contact Dr. Zawicki, uh, one of the brightest, uh, brilliant minds in education. So my friend, I love Thank you so much. much. Thank you for Why coming on here. All on words. It means so much coming from you. And, it, you know, I've told, I still tell people, I'm like, you got to look at Mike. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you're, you're the dude. And uh, it, I, I think people also need to know, you know, I, first of all, I love, I love the title of your book. Love the title. Of Appreciate it. it. Um, and, and it does come from, from some of that time that we spent together at conferences, right? That, that to be bold and kids need that, right? And at your core, you have to be willing to, Take those slings and arrows and uh, you're an inspiration to me. You need to know that. Like there are, there have been dark times in my career and I always, I always read one of the, the thoughts that I think about, you know, and listen, I'm privileged to be in this profession because of people like you and I can associate with you and say, yes, I do this because this guy does what I do too. Um, but you've also been, uh, you know, besides that emotional and intellectual support, you're an inspiration to me. And I'm so, I love, love the book. Love what you're doing. Love the podcast. And I'm so glad to see you in other countries in particular, because you are an international mind. I uh, listen, uh, uh, don't make me cry on VFE. That'll be a first. <laughs> and, and Rob, I appreciate you so much. I will call you this week. We'll get together always. Sounds great, man. Pleasure. And on that note, everybody, onward and upward, have a great evening. Bye.